before getting into chapter 11, we have to finish chapter 10. And we'll do that by uh, looking at the story of the healing of blind Bartimaeus at the end of chapter 10, starting in verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. The opening line of the passage, uh, we need to spend a a little time there. Uh, What it says, and they came to Jericho. Well, which way are they traveling? They're traveling south, remember, from Galilee. They're traveling south. Um, They've gone over to uh, the eastern side of the Jordan River. The Jordan River connects the, the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee with the Dead Sea. It comes just about due south. And um, they've even gone on the other side, on the eastern side of the Jordan River to make it down. What, why would they do that? Perhaps even to avoid going through Samaria, uh, which is on the western side uh, of the uh, Jordan River. So they're on the eastern side, then they cross the river back over, and they come into Jericho. Now Jericho um, is about, well, let's see, it's, it's a busy, busy place. It's about 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So we got Jerusalem here. How can I do this? Northeast, uh, let's call it this way. Let's see, you're going to be this way. I'll do it in the way you see it. <laughs> um, if this is Jerusalem, um, and the Jordan River is running this way. Here's Galilee, way up here. Uh, the Dead Sea is coming, coming down. He crosses the Jer- Jericho from the, east, uh, from the west to the east, and he comes to Jericho. Jericho is about 15 miles, we'll call it northeast, of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, so in there it's a, now what is Jericho? It's an oasis in a very dry parched land. It's low. So all of the, it's a, all of the water is draining into Jericho and it becomes a very a fertile area. And in, in a terrain like that, uh, Jericho is going to be very popular. The roads go through Jericho. It's a very busy uh, a city or village. Um, and so that's the significance of, and they came to Jericho. So um, imagine a lot of people, is it a few days before Passover? Sure. Are people traveling on the road? Sure they are. Uh, so a lot of people, lots is happening in the streets of Jericho. As he's leaving Jericho then, he hears a blind man, a beggar, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Whoa, okay. Uh, He's in Jericho. Um, Jericho's a low land. Um, It's a crossroads, a busy place. Um, And it's uh, Bartimaeus, and uh, he says, um, named Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. That first visit that, um, in verse uh, 46. Why would he say Bartimaeus? Why would he decode that uh, for his readers? He would do it because 
uh, chances are his readers are not Jewish. They don't understand um, how bar means son of. Um, they are, uh, uh, chances are they are, they're, they're in, in Rome and they are um, Gentiles in Rome. These are Gentiles, converted Gentiles uh, that he's speaking to that, that um, Mark is writing for. Okay, bar is son of, bar mitzvah, we hear about that a lot. It means son of the commandment. That means when you, a, a boy reaches um, the age of maturity, 12 or 13, that we have a bar mitzvah. That's son of the uh, commandment. Now Matthew covers this. Um, in, uh, and he says there are two blind beggars there uh, making, a rabbit, uh, making a racket. Now, Bartimaeus gets it. He understands who's coming. He's heard who's coming, and he will not be silent. Moreover, he addresses him how? As the son of David. Um, that's from Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Bartimaeus, maybe he understands that subtly. Maybe he understands that, that this guy, Jesus, has power to restore his healing. Boy, can you imagine how exciting that is. He's heard about it in other places. He's, he's got a chance now, uh, and now is his chance, and he gets it. He will not be silent. What happens? Jesus stops. How many commentaries put a lot of emphasis on this this uh, uh, example. Jesus stops. He hears it. This is a piercing voice. The crowd even sees Jesus stop. And they know why. They know because this noisemaker has gotten his attention and he has stopped. They say to him, take heart. Maybe they're, don't be discouraged. That's what take heart means. And the crowd might have sensed that there was discouragement in this beggar. What else does he do? He throws off his cloak. He doesn't need it anymore. A cloak? He's probably, it's a thick fabric, a thick blanket. It's so thick that he carries, carries it with him. He sits down on it. When he travels from one place to another, he rolls it up, carries, it's kind of like a knapsack. This is a thick blanket. He's throwing it away. He doesn't need it anymore. It's used like a knapsack. He jumped up, comes to Jesus, probably with someone's help. Help me get there. And then, of course, the crowd, don't be discouraged. They know there's, this is something significant. He, they want to facilitate this meeting between Bartimaeus and Jesus. Bartimaeus is not afraid. Jesus asked him the same question. Same question as what? What do you want me to do for you? We've heard that earlier in the chapter in verse 36 when James and John asked him for special favors. Remember that? He says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, we want one of us to sit on the left and one of us to sit on the right and you can decide which one doesn't matter. We're brothers. We want special privilege when your kingdom, in, in your kingdom. Bartimaeus replies that he wants Jesus to restore his sight. A simple thing, right? A blind man would like to be able to see. What happens is he's healed, he becomes a new disciple, and he follows Jesus. Bartimaeus is not looking for glory like James and John. He's got newfound freedom. For Bartimaeus and for the crowd, the presence of the kingdom of God has become visible.
The crowd might have wondered how in the world Jesus chose to heal this sad, pitiful beggar with nothing to contribute, but who had been a taker all of his life. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Martabas brought nothing but his need, and Jesus brought mercy to this man. Joel 2.32, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Call him over here. Bartimaeus, he's calling you. Come over here. Let me help you get to him. Remember the depravity of man, our need, the sovereignty of God, and the sufficiency of Christ. Those three make up the gospel. And remember, Jesus has said in this chapter, if you want to be great, you serve other people. Sinclair Ferguson says, Jesus' greatness never stood out more clearly than when he called this helpless man out of his darkness into the light of a new and more glorious day. Jesus still stops. Jesus still listens. And Jesus still takes sovereign action. This is the gospel in action made visible on the streets of Jericho. Now let's move into chapter 11. Five big things go on in chapter 11. There's the triumphal entry. Jesus curses the fig tree. Jesus cleanses the temple. There's a lesson from the withered fig, fig tree. And then finally, the Sadducees and others challenge the authority of Jesus. This is quite familiar, uh, familiar uh, narrative for us. So Jesus has drawn attention to himself at the beginning of his ministry. Then he avoids the crowds in Galilee. Then he spends private time with his disciples. We've, we've seen all of that so far. Now Jesus makes a public and dramatic entrance into Jerusalem. Some people have, and this is, we've gone through about two-thirds of the Gospel of Mark, and the one-third remaining uh, is the Passion Week. Some people have called the Gospel of Mark the Passion Narrative with a long introduction. We finished the introduction. We're beginning the passion narrative. He'll travel from Bethany, the house of figs. And the next village is Bethpage, the house of unripe figs. Now that's quite a contrast. These are villages close to each other. Bethany has become a popular woman's name. Uh, when you understand Bethany, you don't understand figs, you understand Someone who is charming and cheerful. That's, that's the connotation of the, uh, of the name Bethany. It could be that Bethpage is the village where the disciples go to untie the colt that Jesus says. Go, to the next, go into the village and you'll find a colt there. Bethany and Bethpage are about 10 miles from Jericho. It's about 2 miles east of Jerusalem, on the high ground, on the Mount of Olives. Bethany is 300 feet higher than Jerusalem, and you can have a great view from Bethany, from the Mount of Olives, over the Kidron Valley, which is usually a dry gulch there that handles a heavy rain when it comes, the Kidron Valley. 
So you go down, cross the valley, and then you come up into the temple. So that's where he is. He's very close now to where he's heading. The triumphal entry is carried, uh, is described in other synoptic uh, gospels too. Matthew 21, Jesus enters the temple and cleanses the temple immediately upon entering. In Luke, Jesus cries over the city and then cleanses the temple. In John, the second chapter, Jesus cleanses the temple early in his ministry. Let me now read Mark 11, the first 11 verses. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed as a parade were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He looks around, he leaves, he crosses the Kidron Valley again, he climbs up Mount Olive, the, the Mount of Olives, and he goes to Bethany. Presumably he's going to spend the night with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who live in Bethany. They're going to be, um, he's going to receive hospitality from them. That's just speculation. We don't know that. Hymn 240. I'll, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it. It's one of the children's favorites. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Who is the King of glory? What shall we call him? He is Emmanuel, the promised of ages. Remember that? When we sang it last, I said, what is the name of this, this tune? It's the promised one. It's an Israeli folk song. There's joy in this song. Who's coming? The King of Glory is coming. I'm trying to give you a sense for what the crowd is feeling when they uh, see Him coming. In all of Galilee, in city or village, He goes among His people, curing their illness. He gave His life for us, the pledge, the pledge of salvation. He took upon Himself the sin of the nation. He conquered sin and death. He truly has risen, and He will share with us His heavenly kingdom. What a wonderful hymn for the children to know and to want to sing with great joy. The King of glory comes. Tension is rising. The crowd numbers two or three million people, according to Josephus, 
coming into Jerusalem for the Passover. Jerusalem, the streets of Jerusalem, presumably, are not built to handle a crowd like that. This is a huge crowd. A lot is going on. Jesus has made other trips to Jerusalem. He's gone to other Passovers and maybe other holy days. He's familiar with the city. He's familiar with the temple. Mark and Matthew each mention only one visit to Jerusalem. Luke mentions two, temptation by Satan and the triumphal entry. John mentions four trips to Jerusalem. John 2, Passover, he, Passover, he cleanses the temple. The feast of the Jews and, uh, and healing at the pool. The feast of booths, the feast of dedication. And then finally, John 2. And verse in uh, chapter 12 describes the triumphal entry. Jesus, we remember, is in control of all of these events. You will find, he says to the disciples, you will find, testifies to Jesus' supernatural knowledge. The same supernatural knowledge he displayed the woman at the well. Matthew and John mention Zechariah 9, 9. I'll read it. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The people responded with gestures of great honor. As for a king, the crowd celebrates the kind of Messiah they want to see, even though he didn't look like a warrior king. Who is this guy? How is he going to overthrow Rome? There are no soldiers. There are no chariots. There are no magnificent horses. Psalm 118, we just heard, Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what they were shouting. Maybe they've forgotten, but also God's Word in, um, includes the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is rejection. Remember when Jesus has told His disciples He's going to be rejected, suffer, die, and rise again. So it should not come as news to the, the uh, disciples. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. The rejection that the Christ will undergo will bring salvation to a fallen world. It's a righteous, messianic king coming humbly to bring salvation to Jerusalem. But it's not at all what the folks expected. A great entourage, what would you normally get? A victorious general king coming in, there would be uh, lots of... of uh, People, there would be prisoners coming in. There would be troops, horses, and chariots. Hey, this is a great victory. But you don't have that. What about the Lion of Judah? Or the Lamb of God? What about the warrior king? Or the suffering servant? The Lion of Judah comes from Genesis 49, that whole Jacob is blessing his sons one by one. You remember, I'll just read it. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. That's victory. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. And as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Scepter is a sign of royalty. It's a sign of kingship. It's a kind of govern. It's a kind of authority. That's the scepter. It will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. 
His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. That's Jacob's blessing on Judah. He goes through them one by one, all 12 sons. Hosanna, save us now. Fire from heaven, an earthquake, what in the world do they expect? They're seeing this thing because there are no troops. There's no military might on display. Only military might is going to overthrow the Romans. What do they expect? Verse 10, the coming kingdom of our father David. They're expecting a warrior king. A warrior king who's going to start an uprising to banish the Romans from the promised land. These people are in for a big disappointment. Jesus goes to the temple and looks around. He's probably not happy to see what's been going on. There's no royal reception there. The celebration is over. He'll be back tomorrow. He spends the night with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary up the hill in Bethany. The next day, though, he comes down and he tears into the temple. The temple officials get angry and will question by what authority he has done such damage in the courtyard. Palm Sunday. It's a celebration with an undercurrent of gloom. Now it's like celebrating the anniversary of a failed marriage. So why did Jesus leave the temple soon after he got there? It's a strange ending to a triumphal entry. He curses the fig tree the next morning on his way back down to the temple. Now in Matthew, Jesus cleanses the temple when he first gets there, not the next day. Matthew treats the incident topically, not in a time sequence. Mark, though, arranges them chronologically, sometimes causing him to put a story within a story. In this case, we have cursing the fig tree, cleansing the temple, Lessons from the withered fig tree, a story within a story. The same thing has happened earlier in Mark. You remember when he was going to heal Jairus' daughter in chapter 5. And on the way, the lady with the discharge hemorrhaging interrupted. He stopped and then, so that's one story. He heads to Jairus' house. He heals the lady. Then he proceeds on to Jairus' house. Maybe some people are thinking that Jesus is not the Messiah after all. Big anticlimax here. Big disappointment for the people. We know Jesus didn't come to drive out the Romans, but he came to defeat the power of sin. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom and to reign in the hearts of his redeemed people, like us. The invisible kingdom of God of which we are, have been drawn in as subjects, willing subjects. Sproul says, the meaning of Lord and the Lord needs it the Greek word is kyrios, translated Lord or Master. The Lord needs it. Why are, you, why are you untying that coat? The Lord needs it. Jesus uses the term for himself. And we can understand his meaning, Sproul suggests, as sovereign, Lord of heaven and earth, King of the Jews. The Lord needs it. Sproul says, here's, David, uh, here's Jesus entering David's royal city. Remember that hymn we sing at Christmas? David's royal city on a colt from Bethany and back to Bethany. And the colt probably came from Bethpage. 
colt has never been ridden. The king's mount is only for the king. In John's gospel, Jesus was in Jerusalem four months before his execution. There's a little difference there. Jerusalem, says Sproul, was Jesus' penultimate, penultimate destination. And the temple was Jesus' ultimate destination. Penultimate, ultimate. Pene in Latin means almost. Ultimate means the last. Penultimate is almost the last. The ultimate destination is the temple. On his way down, Jesus curses the fig tree. The story comes in two sections, divided by cleansing the table, uh, the temple. We'll discuss the temple cleansing first, and then the fig tree, and see how those two stories are related. I'll read now from Mark 11, verses 15 through 19. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered where he came. They came down the hill again from Bethany, down the hill into to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a, den of, uh, uh, called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city, presumably back to Bethany. Jesus is angry. He tears into the Gentile court where buyers and sellers were buying animals for sacrifice and where money changers were changing foreign money into temple currency. A lot of study has gone on about looking at the temple, the temple called Herod's Temple. He's the one that renovated it. And, and made it into what, Je what it was at the time of Jesus. It was huge. Temple grounds were 35 acres. The plot that we have here is five acres. Multiply that by seven. 35 acres. The largest portion, it was rectangular, the largest portion was called the Court of the Gentiles. And anybody could go into the court of the Gentiles. And that's where the merchants had set up shop in this huge um, court of the Gentiles. And when Jesus says he prevented people from going, they began to use it as a shortcut. And Jesus put a stop to that. That's what it means when he says... Um, and he would not, verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. It was huge. It became a popular shortcut. Imagine the bustle right before Passover. Animals, visitors, people asking directions, foreign languages, Profitable businesses operating in the court of the Gentiles. Why were they changing currency? Because people had come from foreign countries. They brought their own currency. They, but they couldn't use that in the temple. They had to change it. John 2, let me just describe it. I'll read it to you, 13 to 16. It's a good description of the commerce going on there. 
John says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. These merchants had the buyers over a barrel. They had to have animals to sacrifice. Maybe they didn't want to travel all the way with their own sacrifice, an animal to be their sacrifice. So they come and they, they will, and if they did do that, and some presumably did, if they did, they, they, they risked that their animal, their sacrifice animal, would not meet the standards of the temple and would not be accepted. You can't use that one over here, buddy. You better buy one from here. You got to have it. You're going to pay a premium price for it. That's the kind of thing that was going on. That's the kind of, of, of disruption and chaos that Jesus uh, determined to put a stop to. You can imagine, and we'll close the chapter uh, with this, the temple officials looking around, who in the world gave you permission to do that? Where did you get your authority from to do that, to cause that kind of trouble? He just does it. They leave, they go back to Bethany, and... I'm going to read Mark 11, verse 12, and we'll pick up the story of the fig tree. On the following day, verse 12, Mark 11, verse, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, that is to the bush or the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Skipping down to verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered to its roots, and Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, get this, have faith in God. Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered with, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. What in the world does this have to do with a withered fig tree? The destruction of the fig tree is the only destructive miracle that we know about that's included in Scripture. With the curse, Jesus is condemning the appearance of having fruit without having any. 
even though it wasn't the season for edible figs. This is an object lesson. It's like picking petals from a beautiful flower to support a botany lesson. This is an object lesson. This is a miraculous prophetic sign that God will soon destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Why? Because of Israel's spiritual unfruitless, uh, unfruitfulness or fruitlessness. It's false advertising. It's deception. It's an outward show of holiness, but inward depravity. Jeremiah 8, 13 says, When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. This is a picture of the unholiness of losing the faith, of drifting away from the truth that Israel has, uh, has done. Sproul says, this is a puzzling incident. It might even be considered a waste of supernatural power. Why would you curse and condemn a fig tree? It's vindictive fury against an innocent plant just doing its thing. It's not the season for figs? Well, maybe. For most figs, it's not. Spruill says he has a professor who says there is a species of figs that that, blot, that produce figs in this season. So it could well have been in season, although people said this, this is not a, uh, it's not the normal uh, season for figs. Well, why curse it? It's a vivid, dramatic, prophetic object lesson to illustrate the sin of hypocrisy. It appeared fruitful, but was barren. Though the church is full of sinners, says Sproul, let us not be hypocrites. If you see me sin, he says, and I claim that I don't do such things, I'm a hypocrite. If you see me sin in something that I've never claimed not to do, I'm a sinner but I'm not a hypocrite. We need to talk the talk and walk the walk before the world. Otherwise, we are hypocrites. So you can see the direct link now between the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. The court of the Gentiles was the largest part of the temple made to receive the nations. Gentiles, you're welcome here. Come, come. We have the truth here. Come. But the Jews hated Gentiles and turned the court of the Gentiles into a stockyard for commerce. The pilgrims needed to buy animals, so they needed to exchange their money. Prices were jacked up. Artificially high, that's why Jesus called the temple a den of thieves. Kind of like highway robbery. You get stuck up on the highway, you have no, there, there are no police there, you're, you, you're, you're lost. The Jews hoped Jesus would cleanse the temple of Gentiles. Get them out of here. But instead, he cleansed the temple for the Gentiles. Judaism seemed magnificent, says Sproul, but it was rotten to the core and therefore fruitless. This is a question from Bob.
He's saying when Jesus, in, in John, the Gospel of John, Jesus is recorded as visiting Jerusalem four times. Bob is pointing out that John, the Gospel of John, said Jesus had, made, had visited Jerusalem four times. Um, and when he was in Jerusalem, you can imagine he went to the temple four times. And he had plenty of chances, the, the Jews had plenty of chances to hear the Gospel and to be, to be encouraged to, come to, to repent and be forgiven and find the truth. And Bob has pointed out the same thing that happened is pictured in Luke 13 when uh, you have the unproductive fig tree. The owner says, wait, it's been three years and there's no fruit on here. I'm going to cut it down. And the, the uh, master of the garden says, give it one more year and we'll see what happens. So what Bob is pointing out that the Jews had plenty of time to hear the warning and to respond appropriately, but they chose not to. Let's move on now to, Jew, uh, to verse 20 in Mark 11, verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it'll be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it'll be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive for if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. To move a mountain apparently was a common phrase in the language of the time. To refer to something virtually impossible. Who in the world could move a mountain? Have faith in God. Have faith in God's power, Jesus is saying, and in God's willingness to respond to the prayers from his people. But his have faith in God seems like a non sequitur. It doesn't follow. How is that related to that? It's an imperative. He says, have faith in God. Why does he say have faith in God? Because the ungodly condition of the temple and the fruitless fig tree stemmed from lack of faith. Hypocrisy is a sign of lack of faith. That's the relationship. It seems like an overreaction, especially since it was not the season, but a waste of spiritual supernatural power. Verse 23 seems like an outrageous prayer. Who's going to be able to move a mountain except God? Verse 24, seems like name it and claim it theology. It's a wrong interpretation. If you have enough faith, if you pray hard enough, God is obligated to answer your prayer no matter what it is. That would be not faith in God. That would be faith in faith or faith 
in your feelings or your desires. Warren Wiersbe describes it that way. Warren Wiersbe, I, look, I looked at, at him, and he, his collection went to Cedarville. Um, uh, all, all of his uh, writings would, were donated to Cedarville. Verse 25, pray with forgiveness in your heart. Forgive those who sinned against you, just as God in heaven has forgiven you. And seek forgiveness from people you've sinned against. Look at verse 26. Who can find verse 26 in their Bible? Yeah. Verse 26 is missing in the ESV. The oldest biblical texts do not contain verse 26. So the ESV has not included the verse. Here's the verse. Essentially, it would be something like this. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And some scholars think that a scribe added this verse to Mark so that it matches Matthew 6, verse 15, which is essentially what I've just read. Pray with forgiveness. There's nothing vague about that. David Guzik says that sometimes a hard and unforgiving heart is bigger than a mountain. Ferguson says, a forgiving heart is a forgiven heart. Ferguson continues, he says, like the fig tree, Israel showed outward signs of bearing fruit, but those who approached it spiritually hungry found no nourishment there. Although planted by God and nurtured by His servants, the people of God were spiritually barren and would be cast away. John 15. Jesus may seem callous and angry in His use of power, but His curse of the fig tree shows that He is serious about our spiritual fruitfulness and that we ignore it at our great peril. Be spiritually fruitful. Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon only on verse 24, on prayer. Marvelous sermon. He makes four main points. Let me put that fair that prayer must be focused on something specific. Prayer des desires about that object must be clear and specific. Who are you talking about? What do you want to happen? You must be, support that prayer by faith that God will answer the prayer, one way or the other. And it must reflect confidence that God has heard the prayer and that God's answers are truly received as in God's will. Be specific. Spurgeon says, go into a shop without a specific goal. What are you going to buy? I don't know. Just looking around. Retailers love that. You come in with nothing specific in mind, and you walk out with something, maybe, or you walk out with nothing. If you don't have anything specific, you're, going, you're not going to buy that specific thing. It's like shooting a bow, says Spurgeon, with two arrows on it. If you shoot two arrows, they're both going to miss. Be specific. Choose this one or this one. It's like a ship sailing without a destination. That kind of ship will never get there. Name people. Name results. Name times. Be specific. If you aim at everything, says Spurgeon, you won't hit anything. Remember to whom you're praying. Pray one thing at a time. Use simple and direct language. Engineers build magnificent structures by employing simple fundamentals, one 
after another, time after time. Building marvels like the temple, Herod's temple. One chariot full of whatever they moved dirt in at a time. Had a design, one step at a time, and kept it simple. Pray with real faith, says Spurgeon. God has promised to hear prayers from his people. Prayers won't change God's decrees. So we pray within God's will. The master never sleeps. Believe that God is more than you can imagine. Don't make prayer a romantic fiction, says Spurgeon. Don't approach, approach prayer as a duty. It is a privilege. And one of my felder, fellow elders always reminds us when he opens his prayer that prayer is a beautiful and powerful privilege. Come as a sinner, says Spurgeon, but don't come with sin in your hands. Don't lift unholy hands. What's that saying? That's saying repent from your sin. We're out of time. Next week we'll finish chapter 11. We'll talk about authority. Jesus responds to the officials who said, who, who gave you the authority to, do, to cause the kind of trouble that you've caused here in the courtyard of the Gentiles? That will wrap up 11, then we'll begin uh, 12 next week. I welcome your comments or questions. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. Holy Spirit, would you let these seeds from your word uh, find soft, fertile soil. And Holy Spirit, would you be kind, gracious uh, to grow the truth in our hearts and very souls, that you would be glorified in the expression of this growth, the, the beauty of the flowers that grow, the beauty, assurance, the quietness, the power of the peace that flows from being in your will, in your kingdom, because you have shown us sovereign mercy. We pray gratefully now in Jesus' name. Amen.